do you want to? Oh, thank you for that. Welcome, welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Patricia Lopez. I am assistant professor here at the Kremen School of Education. I'm also the director of Enseñamos en el Valle Central. We have the honor of sponsoring today's Platica. These Platica series have been an amazing opportunity for students. Um, this is a student space, so um, I just want to make sure that everyone who's here is just um, knows that this is a place and a safe space that we cultivate um, for students, future educators, current educators. So please keep that in mind as you enter the space. Um, I want to start us off um, by acknowledging, if we can go to the next slide, that we are here on the traditional lands of the Yokuts and Monos people. Fresno State sits in the midst of the San Joaquin Valley. Um, as our statement says, we're a valley rich in the traditions and representation of Native American peoples and cultures. We're grateful to be on the traditional homelands of these peoples and their diverse tribal communities um, who share stewardship over this land. Um, if you can go to the next slide, um, you know, we often say the Yokuts and Monos people generally, but, you know, the thing to remember it, is that there are many local and smaller community tribes that are still here today. They have not ceased to exist. Um, I personally um, am from Tulare County, so I wanna, this is a map that our amazing colleague, um, Amber Esquivel has put together for Enseñamos and has um, graciously done land acknowledgements for us. Um, but just acknowledging um, where I sit, Tulare County, home of the Tule River tribe, Tule Lake, which is actually highlighted here, just for those who are um, unfamiliar, um, was at one time before settler colonialism, the largest freshwater um, lake west of the Mississippi. So right here rests an amazing um, history and, um, and culture and something that I know very blessed to have grown up knowing um, this history and of these people. and. You know, in the spirit of land acknowledgement and recognition of indigenous peoples, right, this is an ongoing call, uh, process of colonization, um, right, and so talking about this, bringing awareness about these histories, um, you know, these things that are often suppressed or forgotten or erased, right, so to not know is also to contribute to erasure, and so these are things that are, you know, really deliberate, again, this platica, where these are spaces for future and current educators and as educators, it's important, right? These practices that we do this. Um, if this is your first platica, give us a thumbs up. Um, I wanna welcome you. I know we have a, um, a great following. Maribel um, Bravo Mendoza, who does some of our platicas as well as here. And I know that we have students who really see this as a safe space. So uh, give me a heart if you're back for second, third, fourth, fifth time, give me a thumbs up if this is your first. Um, for those of you, if, if you are new, um, Enseñamos en el Valle Central, we are um, an HSI initiative. We're focused on cultivating future ed educators of color committed to equity, liberation, and justice. An integral part of this is promoting culturally, linguistically sustaining ethnic studies, anti-racist pedagogies. We're grounded um, in these ways of knowing, these ways of being right, these anti-oppressive frameworks. Um, and so this is something that we really ground our work in, valuing service to community, political awareness, and critical civic engagement um, for the public good, right? And so you got to live this stuff. It's just not something that we, um, you know, you can't market or brand this. Um, so um, I just want to thank you all for being here. Um, the format of our platicas, this is very, um, open. I'm going to hand it over to um, our presenter. I'm going to introduce our presenter in a, in a second. But just in general, know that this is, um, if we were in a shared space in person, you know, we would just be sitting around having um, a cup of tea, having a concha, whatever is, you know, the flavor of the day. Um, so please, Dr. Rios is here to converse, to open up. She's very familiar. We come from um, kitchen table talks where Platica is 
part of our cultural upbringing. And so just know that you are never interrupting her um, and that this is your space, right? So I'm gonna introduce um, our presenter, Dr. Cristina Rios. She's an assistant professor in the Kremen School in the Department of Special Education, um, Literacy, Early Bilingual and Special Ed. Um, her research interests include parent advocacy for Latinx families and children with significant disabilities. Uh, she also um, really is invested in Latinx parents, how they advocate for services for their children with disabilities. Um, her teaching, her practice, all of this really reflects that in her own personal experience in the Central Valley. Um, she was previously a teacher in Delano. Give me a thumbs up, anybody here from Kern. Let's give a little uh, hands up, some props to Kern County. Um, and so, you know, Dr. Rios is gonna tell her story, right? And who we are um, as teachers, right? Who we are in our journeys actually are very much tied to what we do when we do become teachers, right, in our identities. So I want you all to really um, just kind of hone in and think about those things as Dr. Rios um, shares her journey, um, connect it, right, to where you are at in your own journey. And then at the end, we're gonna actually launch a really cool project that we're gonna be working on together. So Dr. Rios, we're gonna let you do a, sh a shared screen and um, yeah, vamos a platicar. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Lopez. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Can you all see that? Yeah. I would love to know um, first, before we get started, how many students? So if you're a student, give me a thumbs up. Um, kind of get an idea of who our audience is. If you're a faculty, give me a heart. <laughs> So I see some students, awesome. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here. Um, just like Dr. Lopez mentioned, my name is Christina. I'm a first year assistant professor of special education over at Kremen. Um, I'm also a first generation graduate um, and the first in my family to be a doctor of education. Um, so I would really love to know where you're from. If you could just put in the chat, if you're from around the area, if you're near Delano, um, please let me know. But here on the left side of the screen, you could see my little hometown of Delano. Um, we're growing. <laughs> I was born and raised there in Delano. We're up to like 56,000. Um, so it's just down the street from Fresno State, about an hour and a half down the 99. Uh, so that's 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 where I grew up. That's That's where my people there raised me, right? My family's still there. Um, so just to provide a little bit of background about Delano, Delano's culture is very much um, you are either born there, you immigrate there for work, you grow up there, you live there, and you die there. Like, that is it. You know, people who stay in Delano will live in Delano for their whole lives. So it's a very small town mentality. And I really just want to share my experience being raised in that environment, that culture, going out, pursuing my PhD and coming back to the Valley, which is why I, I titled my presentation, Del Valle al Valle, From the Valley to the Valley. Okay. And like Dr. Lopez mentioned, um, I'm here to, to start the conversations, get them going. But if you wanna feel free to share in, chime in. If there's something that I say that resonates with you that you just wanna, share or you want me to further explain or um, you want to share your story, your similar situation, please, please, um, I ask that you just uh, either share it in the chat, interrupt me. Um, I, I would love to foster these conversations and I will be sharing a lot of information. So I, I also want to say thank you for um, providing this space, Dr. Lopez, for me to be vulnerable and share, share my, my life experience. So thank you. Um, so first I wanna provide a little bit of background. This is mi familia, La Familia Rios. <laughs> Here you see a picture of me and my family at my master's graduation at Cal State Bakersfield. That's where I did my undergraduate and master's degree. Um, so for those of you who are students, that basically um, makes us academic cousins, right? Part of the CSU system. Um, 
my parent here you see my two older sisters uh, myself my niece my dad my mom my twin brother and my younger brother back there um, so a little bit of background my parents immigrated to the U.S. at a very young age um, my dad who is the oldest of seven was sent to the U.S. Um, or as we know it el norte right with his uncle and a lot of you might be asking why did you choose the word to describe being sent. Um, usually when you're sent somewhere is for a purpose, right? And his parents told him, you know, we're gonna send you to another country so you could work and provide for your family back home. So uh, four days after his 16th birthday, back in 1982, my dad was sent to Delano, right? And, um, Every, his purpose here was to work. Every cent that he made, he had to send it back to Mexico to provide for my grandparents or his parents and his six other siblings. Um, later, a year after um, my dad, when he visited back in Mexico, he met my mom and they both came over. Um, so my parents decided to settle in Delano because there was work available, which meant that they were able to live a comfortable life working in El Campo, like we know in the fields, right? My mom, however, was not allowed to work. And you might ask, Christina, why, why, why do you say not allowed? Like, what does that mean? Um, what, why do you think I use the word she wasn't allowed? Anybody, if you wanna share in the chat, if based on your own experience, um, if there's anything, why do you think I said she wasn't allowed to work? Is it because maybe she was expected to take care of the family? I mean, that's exactly. what happened with my mom. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing, Susana. Exactly. So in a very traditional Mexican household, there are certain roles that the husband plays and the wife plays, right? In my household, what that looked like for me, my dad worked. He was in charge of paying the bills. <laughs> he provided food on the table and the clothes that we wore, right? Those were his duties. My mom, her role was to stay at home, cook, clean, and raise with the kids, okay? This meant that my mom was responsible in sending us to school, you know, with ironed clothes, clean clothes, making sure our homework was completed. So what did this mean for me growing up? What did that look like? Well, um, my mom attended all my parent-teacher conferences. Um, not once did my dad ever come to any type of school event, right? Including a parent-teacher conference, a track meet, a band competition, because that meant that he would need to take time off of work. And what did that mean? If you don't work, you don't get paid. <laughs> he was the only one working in, and um, feeding a family of seven. So we weren't able to afford that luxury of him to be able to take time off because then that meant we, he wasn't gonna get paid for that day to be able to provide a certain amount of groceries on, the, on our table, right? So my mom was very responsible. She took on the role of ensuring we went to school every day. She helped us with our homework. My parents do not speak English. Um, the little English that my dad does know is what he learned from other farmers, other ag um, farmers here in the area who taught him how to, how to speak English. So growing up, my mom, who didn't speak the language, right, would be in charge of, of helping um, me and my siblings do our homework. And so that meant sometimes when I went home, I didn't know what I had to do, right? And all the instructions were in English. So my mom would take all of us. I remember like all five of us there holding hands to my neighbor's house um, and ask her for help. So, they, so then she could help us complete our homework assignments. Um, if you have a similar story or if you wanna comment on that, please feel free to share. I see in the chat, systemic and cultural reasons. Yeah, thanks, Raymar, for sure. Um, so that was a little bit about my upbringing, uh, but I just wanted to share enough information to have a layout of what this looked like for me growing up here in the Valley. 
So that um, really led to um, why I chose special education. Uh, finishing high school, I was applying for different positions to get a job. Um, and I wasn't at that time too sure what I wanted to do as far as a career. Um, I knew that I wanted to go to college and graduate, graduate and um, I didn't know in what, right? So at the time, thankfully, through the help of my older sisters, they encouraged me to apply at the Delano Elementary School District as an instructional assistant. I had no idea what that meant, right? Um, I didn't know what that entailed, but all I knew is that it meant I was going to be helping the teacher in some way. Um, and in the summer, I applied for this position to work in uh, self-contain, uh, severe uh, students with severe disabilities classroom. So does anybody know what that means, students with severe disabilities, or have you worked with students who have disabilities? If you have, you could give me a thumbs up in the chat, or you could share briefly out loud. Maribel, thank you. Yeah, so I see some of you have had experience working with students with disabilities. So in a self-contained severe, um, students with severe disabilities classroom, we're working more with students who may be nonverbal, um, have uh, more severe intellectual disabilities, um, may have Down syndrome, right? At that moment, I had no idea what that meant, what that looked like. Um, so here I am, 18 years old, going into a middle school classroom with students with severe disabilities. And one of the first students I worked with was a, a seventh grade student named Leo. And I was Leo's one-on-one -on -one aide. And uh, Leo had autism and was nonverbal. And the first thing that stood out to me from working with Leo was a large scar that went down the middle of his head. And I had no idea what it was. So I eventually built the courage to ask the special education teacher why Leo had this large scar on his head. And she replied to me that Leo had the right hemisphere of his brain removed when he was an infant because he had developed hydrocephalus, which is a condition whereby fluid accumulates in the brain, which can cause severe brain damage if they leave it unattended. So this left no option but to have half of his brain removed. Um, so nonetheless, Leo demonstrated the ability to be independent, brave, and self-motivated every time I worked with him. And despite the fact that Leo was nonverbal, he effectively got his point across whenever he communicated. Despite his brain surgery, Leo's intelligence uh, shined through every assignment he completed. So I was very fascinated by Leo's abilities that I went on to pursue my teaching degree in special education. So I earned my undergraduate and master's degree at Cal State Bakersfield. Um, soon after becoming a, uh, um, earning my teaching credential in special education, I became a teacher in Delano. Uh, my first two years, I taught students with mild, moderate disabilities at a public charter school. And my last year teaching, I taught um, students in third through fifth grade in a self-contained classroom with more severe disabilities. So on the left here, you see one of my former students at her high school graduation. And on the right, there's a picture of me with my students in my last year of teaching prior to moving to Illinois to pursue my PhD. So all my experiences from being an instructional aide to becoming a teacher has been in Delano. And all the families that I've worked with um, in Delano were culturally and linguistically diverse. So specifically, mainly um, Hispanic and Pacific Islanders. So families who came from, from the Philippines. And during my years of, um, of teaching, I worked with many families who didn't know how to read or write, right? Similar to my parents um, who, who left education at a very young age. My dad didn't, um, he stopped going to school at, the, at third grade because he needed to work. Same situation with my mom, right? So I was working with a lot of families who didn't know how to read or write. Um, and they trusted me with their child's education. 
And that really sparked an interest in the area that I would do research in. So I look at these experiences that families were facing and I told myself, I wanna do more. I wanna learn, I, I wanna understand. Right. I wonder, I, I want to understand why um, parents don't know about their rights. Um, I want to understand, like, what is the bigger picture going on? What are the systemic issues going on? Right. So being a special education teacher, um, you're choosing to be an advocate. Right. So as an educator, you carry on these different roles. You wear many hats. And one of those for me was being an advocate. Does anybody know what an advocate is? Or maybe you're a student, you said, hey, I've advocated for my family or for my sibling. You could give me a thumbs up, you could share, you could unmute. I see something in the chat. Somebody who paves the way. Dor yeah, thank you. So I feel like a lot of, at least, uh, growing up in Delano, a lot of like Mexican families, you have that one sibling who sits at a parent teacher conference and is translating for the teacher to tell your parent about how you're doing in school. Has anybody experienced that? Thumbs up, heart emoji, anything? Yeah. Yeah. So we're all, we've all been in some way or another uh, an advocate, right? So advocacy is defined as any action that speaks in favor of or recommends um, or argues for a cause, right? You support, you defend on behalf of another individual. So some of you, like you shared, you've served as advocates for your parents, maybe in translating information. Um, or advocating for a sibling, right? So one of the stories that, or not the stories, but one of the experiences that I had working um, during my last school, during my last um, year working as a teacher before I moved to Illinois for my PhD was this parent. And this couple really stood out to me because there was this mom and dad both, both working in the fields, came out early to attend their child's IEP. And he came to me and he said, his daughter had, was nonverbal, had autism. And he said, you know, um, teacher, is there anything I could do to, to help her? Can I just give her a pill and she will become better? And at that moment, I, I was just questioning so many things you know, his daughter was 10. And my question at that moment was how, how, what has, what happens from the moment the child gets diagnosed with autism to now that she's 10, that you're asking me if, if that is a simple solution. And that really frightened me to a certain extent, because I feel like it's a, almost like a societal issue, right? The parent wanted a pill, to solve the issue. And I think society has trained us to think that we can solve issues with a pill, but that's not always the case, right? His daughter had a developmental disability and how me, my role as a teacher there can explain that to him. How can I inform him so he could understand that we need to be providing certain supports for his daughter, not simply a pill, Right. Um, so that story, along with many other situations that I, I encountered working with parents here in the valley, really motivated me to to understand the systemic issues and the pathways um, that need to be addressed, especially for parents who don't speak English, right, or whose primary language is in English. And so this parent um, talking about the same family with their daughter who's nonverbal with autism, um, he was just expressing to me how he was trying to find supports for his daughter. And he said he went to the regional center, which is um, part of the PTI. They get funding here in California to be able to provide services for families at no cost. And he said he went 
and he filled out some forms to be able to apply for an iPad so he could communicate with his daughter because she was nonverbal. She would only point to things um, when she requested certain, certain items. So that's how they were able to communicate with each other. And he filled out all the paperwork, right? And he filled it out in Spanish. He went back to the regional center and they told him that it would, they weren't gonna accept it because it was written in Spanish. And when he's, he's sharing this with me, right? Very invested father. Um, he told me he then hired a translator to help him. And they filled out the same paperwork in English. He was paying the translator. They went back to submit the same paperwork to be able to get this iPad. And the lady at the regional center told him no, because it wasn't you who filled it out which I thought was pathetic. It was a lame excuse. Um, I would love to know if people have any thoughts about that, if you wanna share anything. But again, just barrier after barrier, right? Trying to get this, here is this parent just trying to get services for his daughter. He just simply wants to communicate with his daughter. And the people at that regional center there in Delano were like, no, you know, you didn't fill this out um, in English. And then like you didn't fill it out yourself. So no, we're not going to be able to do this. And he was just so desperate um, to do this. Yeah, Sorry, you, you actually have. Susana has her hand up. I think she wants to oh, add to what you're saying. Yes, please. Ahead, Susana. Susana. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I didn't want to interrupt. That's why oh, I raised please. my hand. <laughs> um, <laughs> No, Dr. Rios, I was just thinking uh, the frustration. I don't know if it's that counselor in me who right away thought like it's the frustration, you know, for a parent yeah. to think about just, is there a pill to give to my son or daughter for this? For me, I think the parent must have already gone through so much to get to that point of just give me something to just yeah. help my son or daughter, you know? And I yeah. can tell you that's that's just me. I think that it's just, you know, as a counselor, that's what I can see right away um, or what I can sense. But I can tell you from a, a personal background with one of my um, um, one of my sisters, she actually has her three kids with some form of a special need, and I myself, um, you know, feel like sometimes I don't have the resources, and I'm so intrigued by what you have to say with all this because I want to help her, and I can also sometimes sense her frustration because she wants to ask, like she wants to know what kind of resources are available for her that she's not getting in the Visalia district. So I, I, I just, I can't wait until you kind of like continue on because I want to yeah. know more about what kind of resources we can provide to those type of parents, yeah. you know, that we yeah. might have around us. For sure. And thank you so much, Susana, for sharing that. Um, it's, yeah, it, I understand too the, the level of frustration, right? This parent going, seeking uh, help at this regional center, not providing them information. So them thinking, all right, a pill, something like that's desperation, right? To a certain extent, I feel like some, some form of stress, right? Like it's, it's a lot. So that's just one story of hundreds and hundreds of stories that I've heard over the years, over my teaching experience, um, over my time working with families. But so we see these layers, right? Not only is there a language barrier, there's also um, a lack of information that is being met, given to these families. So these experience, these firsthand experiences really motivated me to earn a PhD. I wanted to further understand why. I wanted to understand the needs of these families in a systemic way. And I really wanted to understand why, like, why is this happening? We do have a law uh, called IDEA, with, which is the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. And IDEA does clearly state that parents should be equal partners of their child's education, but that's not happening. And I really under wanted to understand if this is stated in the law, and parents don't know about it, are they truly equal partners? I don't think so. I don't know if anybody wants to share anything about that. Um, but when you have parents who don't speak the language, 
who um, are, aren't aware of what their rights are under IDEA law, does the law really reflect that they're equal partners in the decision-making of their child's education? Probably not. Yeah, we got a comment. Maribel, feel, feel free to unmute. I know you have a lot of experience in this as well. She's saying, Maribel say no, not in all cases to your question, Dr. Dios. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I can share. Um, I think I remember going to your job talk and I was very intrigued by the research that you brought with you there. Um, and I was really hopeful that you would stay <laughs> at Fresno State because you do bring a lot to the table, a lot of research that still needs to be done and a lot of advocacy that still needs to be done. Um, yeah, a lot of this hits home. I, I have a brother and a sister. Uh, my sister's deaf and then my brother, he's deaf, autistic, and he has like a mild, moderate intellectual disability. So I, I totally relate to, you know, interpreting, to supporting my mom with these types of meetings, so with IEP meetings, with advocacy, with school districts, school districts that aren't very helpful, that create a lot of challenges and barriers, especially for immigrant families that are trying to, you know, assimilate into a whole new world and um, country, but also having to go through these challenges and barriers of raising children already in a, a new different country, but also children that are born with disabilities, a whole different tier and level of, you know, raising their families here. And a lot of those families get taken advantage of. Um, even to this day, my mom is still fighting, you know, like for, like my sister who's graduating high school to even get transportation to her high school, even now for my brother who is a, an adult and is still fighting to have him be in an adult support services program um, with lame excuses and reasons as to why they can't have, like for example, a one-in-one -one aid. And I think because they create those, just creating those challenges and barriers because they claim to not have the resources or not wanting to educate themselves and be multicultural, like that is oppressive in itself. So um, yeah. yeah, a lot of things that still need to be addressed. So I, I completely support your work. I'm, I'm happy that you're here and um, what you are sharing because I think a lot of that advocacy work um, and having that information for parents is still super important to this day. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much, Maribel. And I think you touch upon so many layers of issues, right? Um, at the district level, uh, in the systemic, at a systemic level, like looking at how much I, since IDEA started, IDEA back in 1975, which is not that long ago. I can't do math right now, but it's almost like 50 years, less than 50 years, 48 maybe, somebody correct me if I'm wrong. Not even 50 years old, right? Very young law. Um, at the initial of the law, the government, the federal government said that they were going to fund 40% right, of, of, of services. You know how much they fund currently today? If you don't know somebody, take a guess. Just throw out a number. Throw out a number. 10%. 10%. Okay, that's a good guess. 15 in the chat. 15, Mike, you're so hopeful. <laughs> why, do you, why, do you have so much, why do you have so much hope in our government? 5% <laughs> from Susanna here. Susanna, yeah. So currently, I, um, they fund, the federal government is funding 12%. So what does that mean? Who covers the rest, right? The other 30, 25%. Well, it falls down to the states. It falls down then to the school districts, right? It then falls down to the actual school. So that's not a lot of money, right? The last thing schools think about are school districts, unfortunately, is special education, okay? So that, 
is a huge issue in itself, which is why for me, it's so important. And I didn't know all of this, right? Being a teacher, I didn't understand this, but this is why it's so important that we have these conversations. It's important that parents understand their rights and they know, they should know that the federal government isn't meeting what they originally said that they were gonna meet. And if people and parents are not aware, then how can we make a change? That's why I'm really sorry if I'm getting like very like passionate about this, but I, it's so important that we let parents know. Um, a few years ago when parents went up to, to talk in DC and advocate for special education, there were like no families who were culturally and linguistically diverse who actually went to talk to their legislators which is very important. And I know that brings on other issues. Um, for example, parents who are not, uh, do not have legal status in the US, that adds on another layer, right? Um, so yeah, I know I could, we kind of went off, but thank you so much for sharing that. I think these are very important conversations that we need to have and inform our students. So that kind of really led me to why higher education? Why, why come back to the Valley and serve here? Um, I really do believe that my teaching and practice are two prong in that I'm really passionate in informing families and teaching families about what their rights are under IDEA. And I'm also with that said, I think about the family side and teaching them. And I also think that as a professor, I'm able to um, reach out to students who want, who are pre-service teachers or in-service teachers and teach them about this. They need to know um, what the law says. They need to know that families are not aware of what their rights are or the majority of them who are culturally and linguistically diverse. They need to know that there's still discrimination that goes on, right? They, that school districts sometimes, oftentimes take advantage of these families. So it's very important that we approach both sides of this, right? Um, just some, some stats and data that I found recently looking at Fresno alone, um, and this data was taken in 2018, 2019, we see that 54% of teachers here teaching in the Valley are white, 29% are Hispanic, 4% are black, and 10% are Asian. So I think those are important numbers to see, to consider um, in the future. So for, for those of you who are students here and are thinking about going into education, go into education, um, make a difference, advocate, advocate because you more than anyone here in the Valley know what, what our families need and you understand what they need. Dr. Rios, just today, and this is funny, not funny, but interesting that a family friend of ours. Um, so, you know, I think the other part of, of teaching and being where you grew up or just being identified, uh, I, um, folks identifying to you, um, you get asked questions that may not always be related to your expertise, right? So because they call you doctor, we um, were asked to diagnose and anyhow, it's a, there's just a lot of funny stuff on, on that end, but I, you know, literally got an, a message today from a family friend who asked me, you know, I want to go into credential. Um, it, this specialized thing sounds really interesting to me, but I don't know what that is. Like, am I going to get a job if I focus on that or should I, or should I just stick to general like the counselor is telling me? Mm. So here's somebody who really did some research was very, you know, like drawn to be a special education teacher. Um, it's a good family friend. She has a daughter with disabilities. And I was just taken back that um, she was in a, 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 she found herself with a counselor who was almost telling her that she would have a hard time finding a job if she had an accelerated credential. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, I think this is something that we, I mean, definitely that, that we're, spending a lot, expending a lot of energy, uh, you know, so it's the education part and educating parents, but also our future candidates, right, about what this really means. So what does that look like, Dr. Zios? I know you, you do this every day, so. 
Yeah. Well, the food is there. All, yeah. Like, first of all, like looking at the news, we, I mean, all of us, I'm sure we could say there's a shortage, right? We need educators, especially now with COVID, there's been such a, a, a huge need. Um, there's always been a need. There's always been a shortage in special education. So I'm just interested to know like where they got that information from, or maybe they just didn't want them to go into. I think, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if, um, and I don't know where this information, it sounds just as illogical as, you know, the parent who, you know, was trying to get the iPad. Right. Yeah. It's so unfortunate. It's sad. It's sad that conversations like that do happen and exist, but mm -mm. I don't know if anybody else wants to share anything at all. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, Along with my teaching experience, I did have the opportunity to teach in a few different countries and mainly in Central and South America um, to get an understanding on how culture and services vary across different countries. And what's funny is that a lot of, a lot of these countries use the American model, right, idea. They use this, which still needs a lot of improvement, in my opinion. We've done a lot for the past 50 years. It's been a law but we still have so much, so much that needs to be done. Um, so a lot of these countries use the, this model. And um, uh, if you're interested, for those of you who are students, if you're interested in teaching or volunteer teaching, let me know. I'd be happy to connect you with the program that I, I did my volunteer work for. They make it very affordable for students to travel and you stay with the family right in that country while you while you teach. So if you're interested in that, I'm more than happy to provide that information for you. So please, please reach out if you're interested. Um, so my experiences of, you know, being raised in Delano, um, teaching, um, even before becoming a teacher, being an instructional assistant in, at various capacities, really led me to my current research interest. So for any of you students, have you had any type of research uh, experience here in Fresno or have engaged in some type of research at any capacity or participated in research? Thumbs up, hearts. Okay. Do you know what research is or wanna like Kind of provide your own interpretation of what what that may look like. Oh, somebody in the chat. So, as faculty and professors, we do engage in various roles, right? We have quite a few different hats that um, we we carry on with us. One of the main ones is that we all teach, right, Dr. Lopez. Uh, Dr. Henderson, Dr. Mahoney, Coy, we all teach, right? So we all teach. And another role that we, we carry on as faculty is we also provide community service um, or university service. And uh, another part of that is that we conduct research. And usually with research, you think of um, what, what do you want to answer? What, what are you curious about? Right. So if you remember me sharing my experiences growing up in the Valley, my experiences as a teacher, I was really intrigued by why, why are families not aware of what their rights are? Why are families trusting the school? Um, why is the school taking advantage of, of these families that don't speak the language? Um, so all these experiences really led me to my current research interests. Um, so my research focuses on Latinx families of children with significant disabilities. So I specifically focus on how parents advocate for services for their own children. And you're probably asking why, like, why is this important? Why is it important that culturally and linguistically diverse parents advocate for services for their school-aged children, especially here in the Valley? Well, 
Um, I've done quite a few different um, parent trainings in the past few years to teach parents about their rights. And this parent here um, really just supplements what uh, the research is showing and the need for more research in this area of family advocacy. So just provide uh, some background um, after doing a parent training. Uh, this is a mom. We asked parents to record themselves and make a video as if they were talking to their local legislators demanding for a change. And here's just one example. Hola, mi nombre es Nancy Aguila. Yo soy madre de cuatro niños. Tres de ellos tuvieron el diagnóstico de autismo. Dos de ellos siguen bajo el programa de IP. Como madre de hijos con necesidades especiales, a lo largo de los años me he encontrado con diferentes dificultades, sobre todo con mi hijo que tiene la discapacidad de autismo más severa. Para mí ha sido muy difícil luchar con el sistema educativo y darme cuenta que en muchas ocasiones parece que el sistema educativo está en favor de los educadores y del personal administrativo y no de nuestros hijos. Desgraciadamente, muchas de las cosas que suceden en el salón de clases, el único sustento que tenemos los padres es el testimonio de nuestros hijos, que muchas veces es desacreditado. Por esa razón y por las experiencias que he tenido con mis hijos, a mí me gustaría sugerir para la ley de IDEA que hubieran cámaras en los salones de clase para niños con discapacidad, aunque creo que sería benéfico en todas las aulas de clase. Eso sirve como respaldo tanto de nuestros hijos como de la propia escuela para aclarar situaciones, pero sobre todo para buscar en conjunto solucionar los problemas de nuestros hijos y que ellos puedan tener el mejor desarrollo. Otro aspecto importante es la integración de nuestros hijos con niños neurotípicos. Me parece que hace falta mayor inclusión en las aulas de clase, mayor convivencia entre niños neurotípicos y niños con otra discapacidad y que haya una mayor capacitación de los profesionales de la educación. Por esa razón también veo importante cumplir el presupuesto inicial de IDEA de un 40% para el fondo a niños discapacitados y no el 12% que actualmente existe. El problema que nos encontramos nosotros como padres es de que muchos de nuestros hijos están con personas que no tienen las cualificaciones necesarias para tratar con niños con diferentes discapacidades, que esto a su vez redunda en un rezago educativo y no permite que muchos de nuestros hijos puedan alcanzar la meta de graduarse y, ¿por qué no?, aspirar también a una carrera universitaria. Otro punto en que me preocupa es, eh, hablando de las minorías, hablando de la inmigración, la ley que no contempla que padres que no tengan un estatus migratorio en este país puedan seguir teniendo la tutela de sus hijos después de los 18 años. Me parece importante que sea considerado que si un niño o un joven con una discapacidad no tiene la posibilidad o no puede ser independiente por sí mismo, siempre pueda contar con el apoyo de sus padres o sus familiares cercanos para poder representarlos en el sistema educativo. Así es que a mí me gustaría que todas estas cosas se tomaran en cuenta como la capacitación de maestros, capacitación del de personal y también poder tener acceso a diferentes profesionales, por ejemplo, terapeutas en el caso de autismo, que los niños dentro del sistema educativo puedan tener también la opción de tener la terapia ABA, que les ayuda especialmente a niños con esta discapacidad para tener un mejor desarrollo. Muchas gracias. So I would love to hear any feedback, any comments, maybe something she mentioned that is concerning or anything at all. Where was this at again, Dr. Zios? Where? Yeah. Um, we did this training in four different states in the Midwest. Okay, okay. Yeah. I really wish I could see a lot more parents be as spoken <laughs> as this lady is, you know, because I can see um, all the barriers that parents face that prevent them from um, having that confidence in speaking up and, and yeah. And requesting what they what they need, you know, um, right. immigration is a big deal. Immigration is a big deal. You know, if they don't feel like they have the rights to even be here, 
of course they're in the shadow. So they're not going to want to speak up and request, demand something, you know, that that their kids have the right to have. Um, so uh, we have work to do, <laughs> definitely, you know, in this area. Yes, yes. And you bring up a good point. So um, she did express that, you know, the, the immigration status here in the U.S. and um, I really want to emphasize that this varies upon every situation in every state, but in order for parents to have like legal guardianship of their child with a disability after they turn 18 years of age, they must be a legal re resident of the U.S. And that was something she was vulnerable about with sharing, and she expressed this to her legislators. Mm -hmm. Dr. Rios, I'm so sorry. I really, I, I hope I could, I wish I could stay, but I have to go pick up my girl from softball, but I'll connect with you later on because I would yeah. want to uh, provide maybe like some kind of a workshop uh, with you if possible for a really college yeah. student. Because I know I've seen several that are interested in special ed. Um, so I really would want to maybe connect with you later on if that's okay. Yeah, for sure. Thank you, Susana. Thank you so awesome. much for coming. Thank you so much, Dr. Lopez, also for providing this opportunity. Yeah, Susana. Yeah, we got to get some more of the, our Readly students yes. in here. So yeah, let's do it again. Just for yeah, so the... I do meet with students. I, I work for the, um, I'm a general counselor, but I'm also working as a pathway counselor for early childhood yeah. education. So definitely we'll connect. Yeah, let's do that. Let's make it happen. Awesome. Oh, thank you. Go. Okay. Be safe, Bye -bye. Susana. Bye-bye. Take care. I know we have about four minutes. Um, but I just want to leave you all with this for those of you who are students who are thinking about going into education. Um, just know that education is one of the most valuable tools an, an individual can gain in life. And um, yeah, I'll leave it there. If you have any questions for me or anything you'd like to share, please feel free. Um, Thank you, Dr. Rios. Yeah, feel free to unmute or um, or throw a hand up or something. We um, oh, thank you, Dr. Mahoney. It's very kind of you. Thank you. Um, yeah, if we have any students who want to ask a question, please feel free. Um, we are going to um, we will do a couple more workshops because Susana, who's here, we do have students as part of our pathway um, efforts. Um, we do have you know high school, community college. Um, students who are interested, um, family, friends, you know, who are interested and, in, you know, just having the resources and having the personal connections to people like Dr. Rios and others to make that happen is important. So um, I want to, I want to respect everyone's time. We have three minutes. Um, if we can put up the, our closing slide. So this platica was centered on, on the idea of, you know, I was real intentional about asking Dr. Rios to not just tell, you know, the spirit of a plática isn't just to come in and like throw a bunch of information, but to engage in conversation, um, like, you know, like you facilitated Dr. Rios, but the power of storytelling is, um, is power, is powerful. And so, you know, as part of um, Enseñamos, we have been doing this with, um, some of our cohort students where we're asking them to share their stories, share their testimonials. Um, I wanna acknowledge Dori and Gabby and, you know, who's really have been sitting down and, um, you know, not often do we, do we share our stories or do we think that our stories can have impact, but they in fact, particularly for racialized groups really do. And so, um, so as part of um, this platica, we're going to broaden and, um, go out, we're working with current educators, but um, also future teachers to tell their story. And we wanna lift that up. So um, please like scan the QR code. Um, we'll also send this out to um, all the students who are RSVP'd. And yeah, this is just something that we, you know, we definitely feel anyone can go out and recruit and put up a bunch of flyers and posters and, you know, do all of that, but um, not everyone can touch people in a way that our stories can. So thank you, Maribel. Maribel just threw the, the link. So um, I know I see a few students. Ozzy, I see you on here. I know you'll be seeing Ozzy's testimonial pretty soon. Um, 
it's just powerful. And, and the way that we're able to know and learn from one another is um, through the power of storytelling. So yeah, so sign up, share with your friends. We'll be getting this out and blasting on social media. So we're just launching this today. Dr. Rios um, will be working with our team. Um, we're just excited. We're excited to you know collect stories, share stories. Um, I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Dr. Rios. Sorry, I'm just responding to some direct messages from students. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. No um, problem. Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you for those of you who are reaching out to me in the private and the private chat. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Yeah. So with that, yeah, follow us on social media. Again, you know, we're recording this just because we know that um, there's just never really a time that works for every everyone. Um, but every time you RSVP, we do send out the link. So we share this on our website and then we'll share it later on. And so, yeah, so give us a follow and reach out. Um, Dr. Rios information as well. Let's drop your email in the chat one more time if anybody wants to, or unless they haven't already reached out to you, Dr. Rios, we'll just put that out. But thank you all for being here. It's four o'clock on the dot. Appreciate you. Look out for the video and, um, Please just share, um, connect folks with Dr. Rios um, so that she can connect with uh, families and communities out here. She makes her way back home. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.